and I'm going to refresh over here. Okay, it says we are now streaming live on Facebook. Yay. So as I always do when I start these, they're always, they always get, it's always our kind of a rough takeoff when we do these Facebook lives. Yeah, but there's I, that lag time, the awkward lag. I see us, we are streaming live. So All right. if you guys are watching this, can you please post a comment, someone post a comment to say, we can hear you, we can see you so that I know that this is working. And I'm actually, as we give people a chance to catch up, maybe post also where you're calling from. And I'm just going to approve a few more people in the group because I sent out a note to my uh, newsletter saying we were talking and a bunch more people are trying to join us. So let me do that. And welcome everyone as I'm doing this. This is what is now becoming like a weekly Facebook Live. Oh, I know they've been it's been really fun to, to get to connect in this way and bring on awesome people like yourself. And <laughs> all right, I'm just going to go back and make sure this is working. See if someone has commented and said that they can hear us. All right, shows that there are 10 people watching right now. If you are one of those people, can you please comment? Just say, we can hear you just fine so that I know that this is working before we get into the good stuff. Katie, tell me where you're uh, calling in from or tell all of us where you're calling in from. I am calling in from Groton Long Point, Connecticut, which is a tiny little beach town on the Connecticut coast, just near Mystic, which mm. sometimes people know Mystic from the movie Mystic Pizza from a long time ago, Julie Roberts. Um, mostly <laughs> filmed in Stonington, but we still like to take credit. <laughs> That's so funny. And otherwise you wouldn't know it unless you, unless you lived here or knew someone who lived here, you've never heard of it. So it sounds really peaceful, sounds, a little coastal town. It is. We're surrounded by water on three sides and uh, it's a small little town, kind of multi-generational people just sort of keep migrating back for, you know, weeks, months at a time. We typically don't stay here this long. We're usually back in Los Angeles by now, but since the kids are learning on laptops, we're doing it from here because it's so nice and there's deer in our backyard. So why not? Oh, that sounds, I wish I had deer in my backyard. That's awesome. <laughs> well, okay, let's get started. I know you're super busy because you have a book has come out this week and I know you're just uh, crazy and you have limited time today. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to just read your official bio as a formal uh, welcome so people under, understand who you are and, and everything that you're doing in the world. So Katie Hurley is a child and adolescent psychotherapist, parenting educator, public speaker, and writer. She's the founder of Girls Can, empowerment group for girls between ages five and 11. And I, as a former teen girl, young girl advocate, I love that. Hurley is the author of the award-winning No More Mean Girls, The Secret to Raising Strong, Confident, and Compassionate Girls, The Depression Workbook for Teens, Tools to Improve Your Mood, Build Self-Esteem and Stay Motivated, and The Happy Kid Handbook, How to Raise Joyful Children in a Stressful World. Uh, Katie covers mental health, child and adolescent development, and parenting for the Washington Post, PBS Parents, Psychology Today, Everyday Health, U.S. News and World Report, many, many other places, and she <laughs> practices in the South Bay area of Los Angeles and splits her time between L.A. and coastal Connecticut, as we just heard with her <laughs> husband and two children. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And I'm just going to say this up front, and I'll say this later on, too. Um, this is Katie's brand new book. I don't know if it's backwards for you all uh, looking at this, but it is amazing. I I'm going to scroll down to see if it's backwards on my page here. Um, I have, I actually got this, a year of positive thinking for teens, daily motivation to beat stress, inspire happiness and achieve your goals. And I got this a while ago and I um, have been going through it with my guy. Um, Yay. it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Thank it's you. like yummy. Like if you can, if the book can be <laughs> yeah. yummy, it's got, it's really it's kind of fun. Yeah. It's beautifully designed. So anyway, um, <laughs> I'll say this now and I'll say it later that I'm going to do a little giveaway. I didn't tell you I was going to do that, Katie, oh, but fun. I'm going to give three copies of this away. So the way that you can be entered for the giveaway, you guys watching this is to, ask a question in the thread below or leave a lovely comment beyond just where you're 
watching from. So I'll remind you about that later. So Katie, what I talk with my community about is to have a conversation about teen mental health. And I know that you are working with a lot of teens. Could you just take a few moments and tell us what you are seeing, what, what you're noticing in, in your practice with teens and what are, what are you seeing from a professional perspective that teens are struggling with so much right now? Well, I'm seeing a lot of loneliness and a lot of isolation. So that's kind of, I know everybody's worried about anxiety and there is a fair amount of anxiety. Um, but I think the number one thing I see is loneliness and sort of some symptoms of depression are starting to crop up. I mean, we know that anxiety and depression were on the rise before the pandemic started, before the schools all shut down. Um, we don't have the exact numbers right now. It's reasonable to assume that those numbers have climbed a little bit even more during the pandemic, but they're just, teens are doing their best. Um, and I always say this, they're kind of always doing their best under difficult circumstances. The teenage brain is very much under construction all of the time and there's a lot going on and there's a lot of obstacles they face even in a perfect world, you know, when there is no pandemic and when they get to go to school every day. There's just a lot. So right now they're feeling really helpless and a little bit hopeless. And those are two words we really think carefully about um, when it comes to mental health, because we do know that suicide risk increases with a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. We know that kids who feel and teens who feel this way are usually facing some level of depression. And so we worry, you know, again, about suicide risk and just about um, teens feeling isolated and depressed. It's very difficult right now to find help and resources. And while there are some groups starting to pop up on Zoom um, and there are some good resources, they're tired, they're burnt out. <laughs> you know, these teenagers who love to love, love to be on TikTok all the time are tired. They're tired of the internet, they're tired of Zoom, they're tired of TikTok, they're tired of everything. So, um, it, so where does that leave them? Because right now that's primarily how they connect with other teens and how they find their friends and you know there just aren't a ton of options so I'm really spending a lot of time helping them well really just validating how they're feeling and empathizing with them because that's huge sometimes you know one thing that happens and I think parents are always doing things from a great place of just wanting to encur be encouragers you know um, but teens hear a lot of empty statements like, it's going to be okay, it'll end soon, it'll be back to normal soon, you're going to be fine, just keep trying, um, you know, you're, you're so great, everybody loves you. And they hear a lot of that and it feels really empty because right now they feel like they're not allowed to do a lot of things um, and they don't have a lot of outlets that are healthy for them right now. So they're, just, so what, you know, <laughs> they're sort of, they feel like they're drowning a little bit. And so I'm working a lot on just empathizing with them and helping them know that it's okay that they feel this way and that help is out there. Um, but also that I can't promise anybody that this thing ends anytime soon. You know, this, this sort of false promise of the return to normal is hanging heavily over them. And that kind of increases the anxiety because it's the anticipation. Yeah, I, I, on that last point, that's something I'm really mindful of is, um, you know, just trying to not put anything out there about what I think might happen or what I'm, you know, not that I'm a doomsday person, but I, I don't want to put anything out there. So it builds up this anticipation, setting up for another disappointment or more disappointment. Right. Yeah. So, okay. And I'm just going to encourage everyone who's watching this to just take a deep, big breath right now, yeah. yep. because this is heavy stuff. And for sure. Yeah. And for those of us raising teens, it's um, something that we, it's with us constantly, the concerns that we have over our kids' mental health. And I'm wondering, you know, even in terms of depression, I, I think there's there, and I just want to say this, actually, if you guys have a question, please post it in the chat. I will be monitoring that um, and we'll get to, to those um, as well. But how do we know you know, if, if this is typical uh, within the context of COVID, if this is typical being down or if it's moving into clinical depression, are there certain things that we want to keep our eyes open for? Right. So, I mean, I keep saying right now, anything goes and that's like not comforting, I know, but um, 
the number one thing is, and I say this to every parent, believe it or not, you know your teen's baseline better than anybody. So think back to pre-pandemic, think back to how they were interacting with other kids, uh, what activities they might've been doing, what their interests were, how passionate were they about things, you know, how enthusiastic were they about things. That's their baseline. You know who your kids are as people, as humans. When you start to notice a big change, and right now it's reasonable for kids to be feeling a little bit depressed. That doesn't mean it's a clinical depression. That doesn't mean it's a lifelong depression. Um, you can be depressed. You know, you can exhibit symptoms of depression in response to a stressor. And a lot mm -hmm. of that is happening right now. And it's gonna take a while to lift that because like I said, they're kind of feeling stuck right now. Um, part of why I wrote this book, I, wrote, I signed on to write this book before the pandemic hit. Right as I sat down to write, Los Angeles got shut down for many, many, many months. Um, and I wrote this entire book while I was in lockdown in my house in Los Angeles. And um, it was an interesting experience, but it also sort of motivated me because I, I kept thinking like, if I feel this way, imagine how a 14 year old, a 15 year old, a 16 year old feels. So, you know, packed in this book are the little bits of hope that you all need. So the things they can do to work through this, because just because times are dark does not mean we are doomed to darkness forever. So, and it's really important to remember that, but um, back to your question. Um, so if you are noticing, we always kind of say, you know, two weeks is sort of the magic number, but I would say give it a month since we're in a pandemic. But if you're seeing, um, depression looks a lot like irritability in teenagers in the movies it's always like really sad and not getting out of bed um, in real life teenagerville it's a lot of anger a lot of irritability a lot of door slamming a lot of um you know maybe unkind words and and things coming at you uh, teenagers tend to feel outward so where younger kids will sometimes hold, internalize things they tend to throw it at you to get it out um, so if you're seeing a pattern of that kind of behavior for two weeks or more, maybe a month, given the circumstances, that's a pretty good indicator that they probably need some help. Um, sometimes there will be sleep issues, either difficulty falling asleep, insomnia, where they're night waking and can't get back to sleep, or just like oversleeping, like they're sleeping all the time, can't get out of bed, don't want to get out of bed, they get out of bed, eat and go back to bed. Um, that's not normal. We do know that teens sleep more and maybe keep odder hours than they used to when they were younger, but it's not normal to want to be in bed all the time, isolated in your room. So that's something to look for. Eating habits will probably change. And usually it's that they're not eating. Um, sometimes, you know, some kids will overeat. Typically it's that they're just not really eating. And part of that is they're in bed all day. They're not exercising. They're not drinking water. Um, and so everything's off. So they, they might have stomach aches, they might have headaches. So you're gonna start to hear a lot of physical complaints along with just that isolating. And then you'll notice they'll go from, you know, tick-tocking, you know, a few times a day to barely tick-tocking to not at all. But, they'll go, you know, they'll use Snap and then they'll stop using it, stop using it. And suddenly it's like, oh, what are your friends up to? And they literally have no idea because they've cut off all their friends. So that's another sign. And if we're noticing those signs, you know, my first instinct would be to get professional help to, to reach out to yeah. someone. What do you recommend? I do. I recommend to get professional help as quickly as possible. I know there's still a little bit of a stigma and people still feel like, well, I'm not sure, you know, I don't want it on their record. It doesn't have to be on the record. Okay. Um, a lot of people like me just want to help kids and we don't need to be writing reports to send to schools unless you request that. So, you know, everybody's entitled to help. Um, everybody's entitled to have somebody get them, help them get through difficult times, especially teenagers. The sooner you have someone intervene professionally, the faster they learn to cope, the better off they are long-term because the risks of not getting treatment when you're fighting depression are substance abuse and suicide risk. Mm -hmm. So those are two really big risks that we don't wanna take. And um, the best way to find somebody is word of mouth. Um, you know, you can Google until your eyes fall out, but start asking other parents. If you're in like a community Facebook group of just moms or just dads or moms and dads or grandparents, whatever it is, you know, any combination of grownups taking care of teenagers, just ask, don't be afraid to ask, say, anybody know anybody who works well with teens? 
and you'll start to get some answers. Okay, awesome. Now you mentioned loneliness and that is something that I know in this community in particular of parents raising yeah. differently wired kids, uh, kids on the spectrum, kids who, who already may struggle with social connection have seen what little social connection they've had um, disappear. I just got an email from a parent yesterday stating that exact thing, like these tenuous relationships are now gone. Um, I'm just wondering what, what advice or, you know, are there things that we can be doing to help our kids with social connection that we may not be thinking of during this time? Right. Um, okay, so the name has flown completely out of my head. So Debbie, I'm going to send you the information later, yes. and then you can share it we'll with your community. It, yeah. But um, there's actually a great group of people in Philadelphia that have put together a weekly teen group. And it's just, it's not depression group. It's not anything group. It's like a no label group, right? But it's for teens to just meet up on Wednesday evenings. Every Wednesday evening, they meet up 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, for like an hour and there's a moderator and it's just teens from all over coming together and talking on zoom and just like hanging out and some mm -hmm. don't talk and just listen and others talk and so it's just a great resource I think for everybody to have right now because that and it's new and it's building so it's getting bigger each week but it's just a great resource because there are so few places for kids to go um, you know, I've been, in, you know, one thing that's happening is parents are so concerned about screen time and rightfully so. I mean, a lot of kids, even if they're hybrid learning, then they're spending maybe three days a week learning online. So they're on computers a lot. They like to play games. They like to do social media. Um, I'm telling parents just, we're not counting hours right now, you know, <laughs> like somewhere along the line, two hours became the magic number. It's totally unreasonable right now. They're spending six seven hours a day just doing school online, forget it. We're not counting hours. You know, if you have a kid who likes to play games and can chat with other kids while playing games, good, that's a social connection. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a kid who likes to Zoom one-on-one -on -one with one friend after school for a little bit, great, there's a social connection. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have other parents anywhere nearby you who are willing to just go out for a walk, masks on, if that's possible in your area, stay a little bit apart, but be together. Great. That's a social connection. So, or meet up and walk dogs together or, mm -hmm. you know, something it's easier. We find consistently over and over again, it's easier for kids who have trouble connecting to connect when they're facing forward walking. So I always suggest dog walking or just walking through a park or something, dribbling, a, whatever they like to do, um, because it's easier if you're not staring at each other to connect and talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you have someone that's willing to do that, I think that's, that's great. And that's a great connection. Um, if, if they don't like to zoom one-on-one, -on -one, um, but they might snap back and forth or just text back and forth, funny memes. I mean, everything counts as communication right now. And I think we really need to remember that, you know, sometimes, and parents will say like, oh, it, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. They're sending, you know, 30 messages, but they're all emojis. It's like, so what? <laughs> so they're emoji talking. It's a connection and it's communication. Let them do it. You know, mm -hmm. whatever it is that they feel comfortable, let them do it because they need a connection right now. And sometimes for kids who are differently wired, it might be an older cousin, um, an aunt or uncle, a family friend, someone they know well already that they enjoy talking to about something. They have a shared similar interest or something make those connections happen, however you have to do it, whether it's mm -hmm. on Zoom or FaceTime or whatever it is, find a way to make that happen once a week so that at least they have that thing to look forward to. Right, yeah, that, that lots of good advice. And I love the idea of that walking because it's so true, you know, yeah. um, just walking, looking ahead or looking around, but you can still yeah. keep the, the conversation going. What about motivation? That is something that I've gotten a lot of, there've been a couple questions that popped up here and I hear that a lot. Just, um, I mean, teens can already struggle with motivation sometimes. Yeah. And, and a lot of us are working at ha having our kids feel more self-directed and, mm -hmm. um, and now their motivation is really tanking. So I guess maybe the question is how much do we push? How much do we kind of except that this is the reality right now and it's feeling that motivated actually makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah. So I have said for years and years and years, meet your kids where they are. They're living in a bizarro world, going to school online, um, you know, not being able to connect with their friends in the way that they like, in the way that they've grown accustomed to. So I don't see the value in pushing them right now. And I know that's hard. And part of why that's hard is because we're all home too. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we're seeing it. You know, we don't usually see what actually happens in the classroom all day long, day to day. So we, we get a general sense of, you know, what comes home, but we don't actually see how our kids interact, how they manage things that are confusing. How do they ask questions if they don't know something? We've come, we're becoming these micromanagers because we're around and we're sort of like one ear listening in and trying to figure out which teacher's doing the best job and all that stuff. It's like, we have to step back, let this be, you know, we can't control it. And I say it in the book and I say it always, we have to step outside of what we can't control and focus on what we can control. We can control how we react to our kids. We can control how we interact with them, how we support them, how we empathize with them. We can't force them to do more than they're doing. A lot of kids are phoning it in right now. That is the truth. There's a lot of that going around. They're texting on the side. Um, you know, they're doing things. They're half paying attention to their classes. Someday we'll go back to a different version of school and, and we'll be out of this. We don't know when that is. Pushing them right now when they're under so much stress. A thing I hear over and over from teens, all kinds of teens, all kinds of minds, you know, in the spring, we were in crisis learning. Everybody just sort of threw things together. Let's see what works, we'll do our best. It was kind of a wash for most people across the board. Mm -hmm. Over the summer, teachers got hip to the breakout room on Zoom. <laughs> Everybody's pushing breakout rooms and the kids hate it. It feels like pressure. They get randomly sorted into a room with five, six, seven, eight other kids. Half the time they don't really know them well or they're not, you know, if they were in a classroom and the teacher said, group up, kids typically find someone they know, they make eye contact before they commit, you know, they have little, you know, nonverbal cues they use to get into groups that make sense to them. Now they're being randomly sorted into these groups. They're being randomly spotlighted for no, like without raising their hand to answer questions. There's all kinds of things that are happening that are like what I would call micro stressors within these Google Meets and Zoom rooms. And it's just a lot. So, you know, if your kid is phoning it in and not at their best, I, I think it's all right. You know, they're gonna come out of this okay, but not if we pile on extra mm -hmm. pressure and stress. Yes, you are speaking my language. I, this is a hard, it's a hard one for parents yeah. to swallow, especially, you know, again, if some of our kids are maybe already lagging in certain yeah. skills or areas, then we feel this yeah. added pressure we might be seeing our kids regress and what mm -hmm. does that mean? And, um, you know, I, I'm reminding people regularly to kind of not just lower the bar for ourselves as parents, but for our kids as, as well and taking as many demands off their plate as we can. Yeah. I, I do believe that, well, I know that when, that when kids are motivated, which I believe our kids will be again in the future, yeah. that they can really move through things so quickly and make progress when they feel invested and, and motivated to do that. So I'm trying to just remember that, that this is a moment in time that we're getting it through. That's it. It's a moment in time. It's not a great one, but it's a moment and we'll move on to another moment at some point. And I, you know, it breaks my heart because one thing a lot of teens keep telling me, even the ones who really resisted school before the shutdown, they miss just the physical presence of the teen teacher in the room. Um, you know, they miss the teacher walking around the room while they're in groups and trying to cobble something together. And, and so many kids complained about group think, and that was the hot thing right before the shutdown. Everybody was doing group think. I'm, I don't like group think. It's not my thing. So I'm always like, ah, whenever they talk about it, but, um, you know, they were dealing with that. They were learning how to manage their anxiety about that, but the teacher would always be sort of wandering through the groups and just present. And, it, it's really hard to ask a question right now. It's hard to get extra help right now. You can't just linger after class to ask a question. So, so many things that are complicated right now. I think we just have to leave it be and, you know, support them as much as we can through this until we get to that next moment. And you talked, you know, at the very beginning about validating and empathizing that that's kind of the number one thing that you're doing 
that's what I'm focusing on as well. I mean, is that kind of the best tool in our toolbox at this point? It really is. I mean, empathy is huge right now because it's hard for everyone. You know, this is, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm dog tired every night. Every night, it's been seven yeah. months. I don't have a night where I don't want to just crash into bed. And I'm like, how did I, well, okay, I have to do this again tomorrow. How did, what do I need? How do I get through this? Um, so if I feel that way, I know that younger people, teenagers and younger kids are definitely feeling that way times two. So we just have to listen. You know, I always tell parents use the 80-20 rule. You got to listen 80% and talk 20%. Um, because we tend to talk 80 and listen 20. And we do that. We come from a good place. We have good ideas. I know I'm full of excellent ideas all the time. Um, not <laughs> always too. welcomed by my kids, <laughs> but, but I have both. So, you know, it really, it takes practice to just sit and listen and absorb and say, wow, that sounds really hard. How can I help? What can I do? What would make you feel better right now? Um, and teenagers tell me all the time, that's what they need. They just need their parents to listen to them. And it's complicated because, because of their brain development and because of just general irritability that comes with hormones and things and growing, they tend to push us away at this time. This is the time where they explode outward and sort of push us away and say things that make us want to retreat and not be around them. It's our job to be around them anyway. It's our job to not personalize it take a deep breath and be around them anyway. I love the Calm app. You talked about taking a deep breath earlier. Um, my teens all love the Calm app. That's the one mindfulness app that every single one of them comes back to me the next week and says, oh, I love the Calm app. <laughs> Boys, girls, all of them. <laughs> so that's the one I recommend the most for teenagers. But I also use it for myself um, because you, know, you use it when you're calm, you use it when you're not calm, you use it throughout the day. And it just reminds you to just Focus on now, you know, what we can do right now is handle right now. Mm -hmm. There's no sense in worrying about everything else right now. This is hard, right now is hard. So let's focus on it, get through it, help our kids through it. And then we'll worry about the next thing when it comes. That's great. So that's the Calm app. I, mm -hmm. I will check that out. It's been mentioned many times. I, I've used Headspace in the past, yep. um, but, but I've heard a lot about Calm and I just have to circle back to what you said when you said you know that we're when our kids are throwing stuff at us like it's our job to keep showing up even and and not take that personally those are words that I have to say to my husband on a regular basis oh, like yeah. yep. sorry you don't get to just walk away from it you have to just keep keep going in um and yeah so validating empathizing what I also am trying to remember, it's not like a once and done thing. It's like a daily thing, multiple times yeah. a day. Like you just can't do it enough at this point. So what about someone posted, how do I know when to leave it be or when to intervene? You know, if something's going on, I think that is a balance that we do with teens. Cause at a yeah. certain point, we also want our kids to know that they, it's okay to have big or hard sad, difficult emotions and, you know, knowing that they're safe and let them kind of be in that. And sometimes we really feel like we need to intervene and step in and support. Do you have any um, thoughts around when to know what to do? Well, I was recently talking with a freshman in high school. At this time, this, this hybrid virtual mess that they're in right now, by the way, is particularly hard for ninth graders and sixth graders. Those transition kids that don't know the teachers mm -hmm. are trying to get the know the teachers over Zoom or Google Meets. Um, it's really, it's been especially difficult for them because it's really hard to bond with people over a computer, especially yeah. when there's other people in the classroom sitting there too distracting and, and just being there. So um, that's been a particular challenge. But I was talking to a, a ninth grader about a week ago and she was, you know, talking away about this, that, and the other. And then she took a deep breath and she said, you know what? This really sucks. And I said, yeah, that kind of sums it up. And she said, are you allowed to say that? <laughs> I said, I'm allowed to say whatever I want, but you're speaking truth. Like, this is really hard. Um, so, and I just felt like she got that out and then she laughed and she was like, it's just my mom would tell me not to say that. I said, well, I get it. But, you know, this is hard. This is just hard. So, 
I always say to uh, parents that I think, if, you know, we have to keep showing up, but sometimes teens will send pretty clear signals that they just want to cool off, you know, in their rooms. And so I always say, you know, say to them, like, I know you can do this. I know you can handle it. I'm here if you need me. If you want to bounce ideas off me, um, if you just want to talk through something, I'm here. So don't hesitate. I'm here. No judgment. I love you. But I know you can do it. Uh, because one thing we inadvertently do sometimes is send the message that we don't think they're capable. And they are. Their teenagers mm -hmm. are quite capable of solving their own problems. It's just sometimes they need to go through that sort of mini explosion process first and get all the feelings out. So, mm -hmm. you know, validating that and empathizing and saying, yeah, this is really, this looks like it's really hard. I get it. I understand why you're feeling this way and just sort of standing by. And then when they come down saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm happy to listen and, and you can talk through your how you want to handle this with me uh, or you don't have to so it's up to you but I want you to know that I'm here and I'm here to support you through it that kind of gives them some agency and it gives them a choice too you know mm -hmm. do I want to get help do I want to try this by myself first and they may say I have to handle this alone and then they may come back to you sheepishly later and say it didn't work out can you help now and that's okay too mm -hmm. you know I mean I think we're right now we're so consumed with everything that's happening. I mean, on top of the pandemic, we have all these world events that are scary and overwhelming at the same time. And I think we're so tapped out emotionally that, you know, we're forgetting that it's totally normal for teenagers to fail a lot along the way to try mm -hmm. and fail and try and fail and try again. And that's actually how they build resilience. We keep telling them, be resilient, try harder keep going. And that's not resilience. I mean, resilience is built over many, many years, many, many micro failures later. Mm -hmm. That's how we mm -hmm. become resilient. Mm -hmm. You're a very wise woman, Katie. I just have to say that. <laughs> I want to yes. take a moment because we have more people on the Facebook live just to reintroduce for people who are joining us. I'm talking with Katie Hurley and we're talking about teen mental health. You probably picked that up. I wanted to show Katie's amazing book again, which is a year of positive thinking for teens. It's like a daily motivational that's actually super teen friendly. I have tested it um, and, and I'm doing a giveaway. So if you guys want, I'm going to give away three of these so you can leave um, a comment or question in this thread to be entered. I would love to know, um, cause what I've been doing with this. So basically every day um, the, the calendar year um, you had, I should have had this marked for today. Every day of the calendar year, there's a little message, right? That our teens can read the way we've been doing it is actually reading it the night before what's on tap for the next day, yeah. kind of helping set an intention. Um, yeah. and they're little right They're So yeah. here's the one for today is it's called three questions. It's just this right here. So I'm wondering, you know, for parents who are, who have kids who may struggle with um, just expressing their, uh, their emotions or kind of um, just making sense with what's going on inside who, who struggle with inner self-talk, all of those things, how I'd love to hear a general answer on how we can support them. And then also maybe how we can use this book or how you kind of built that into the way that you yeah. wrote this. Got it. So, you know, I always say the thing that people get wrong about positive thinking is that they think it's just think positive. Right. <laughs> That's not how it works. Be happy, yes. <laughs> Nothing's more annoying than when yeah. someone tells you to think positive when you're in a bad mood. Yeah. Um, it's just like, don't worry, doesn't stop people from worrying. It's, those are just words. Um, so here's the trick to positive thinking. In order to become positive thinkers, we have to be willing to let in our negative thoughts and listen to our negative thoughts and examine them and then figure out how to be positive from there. So it's not like bat away all the negative thoughts and just fill your head with rainbows. That's not how it works. We have to actually engage with negative thinking. For teenagers, um, intrusive thinking can happen quickly. It can spiral and it's you know um, cyclical. So it goes around and around really, really quickly mm -hmm. and it can snowball really fast. So the trick is to say to yourself, what what is this thought that I'm having? You know, what am I actually saying to myself and say it out loud? Like, I'm a loser and I have no friends. Well, why am I saying that? Because nobody's texted me, nobody's reached out to me. I, I sent out a Discord call and nobody answered it. You know, obviously no one likes me because all the things I've tried aren't working. So that means no one likes me and I have no friends. That's how negative thinking starts. Negative thinking is very sticky. So it starts and it spirals quickly. So what we do is we take that thought and we take a deep breath and then we say, 
Well, let's be realistic. Let's have real deal thoughts now. So I, I do have friends. And just yesterday, a friend reached out to me about something. Um, and two days ago, I was on a big game with a group of people and we were having fun. So those are real deal thoughts. Those are grounded in reality. Those are what's actually happening, not intrusive. And then we reframe it to a positive. I know that I'm a good friend because people like to play games with me. They reach out to me for help with their homework. Um, you know, they call me to go for a walk on the weekends. So that's how we switch a negative to a positive. The trick is it's like building muscles. It takes time and practice and it doesn't work every single time. Sometimes you feel so overwhelmed that you have a hard time engaging with that negative thought process. That's okay. I tell teenagers all the time, you know what? Sometimes you really do need to just binge watch on Netflix for a little bit and get into a different headspace. Or sometimes you just need to go outside for a walk and see what else pops into your head as you're walking around and breathing fresh air, depending on where you live. <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's not always easy to just flip it to the positive. But that's why in this book, I tried to make everything super, you know, bite-sized and small and little strategies. Um, there's some of it is just, you know, daily affirmations that they can use. I have teenagers all the time create with sticky notes, um, just power words walls. Or I'll, I'll say like, you know, write a word or a phrase on a sticky note that makes you feel good, that makes you feel confident, like, you know, I'm a good friend, stick it up on your wall. And then, you know, the next day, add another. Every day, add one phrase to your wall until your wall is full of sticky notes that are all these sort of positive things you're good at, things you enjoy doing, people who are um, important in your life, you know, friends that you really enjoy connecting with. Put all, If you plaster your wall with that, every time you walk by it, you're reminded that you have good people in your life, you have hope, um, you have skills, you know, you have things to look forward to. So there's a lot of little things like that in the book peppered throughout and then just strategies to learn how to reframe thinking because it does take practice. And, you know, not every strategy works for every teenager. And it's always important to remember that because they're so different. Um, they're so different, <laughs> every single one of them. Every brain is completely unique. I don't care who you are. Every brain is completely unique and processes feelings and emotions differently. And we have to remember that because what works for me may not work for you. And that's all right, but we can find what works for you. We can start with what works for me, talk about it and figure out what works for you. So mm -hmm. taking some of these and even tweaking it in a way that makes sense um, to them. And, and teenagers are good at that. You know, when you give them a resource, they're good at flipping through it and then saying, oh, I liked that, but here's what I did differently. Um, I used my art journal and instead of doing a sticky notes wall, I have a whole journal full of these, you know, phrases that I etched with my pen, my special pens and blah, blah, blah. They come up with all kinds of ways, ways to do these things. So mm -hmm. that's why that's I kind great. of wrote it this way. Yeah. I love that. And I also love the reminder that this is building muscles. So it's just something we just like the way we validate and empathize. It's a regular thing that we, we want to be doing now. We also like every, every time, right. That our, that our child is able to kind of tweak, you know, or find evidence to disprove a negative thought or belief that's, yeah. that's, uh, you know, it's rewiring the brain in a little way. So we're just building yeah. more, more and more. I, I want to ask you, and I want to be mindful of the time because I know you, you have to you get a busy schedule. So I just want to thank you, first of all, for taking this time. People are so happy um, to be having this conversation. Okay. It's much needed. And I'm wondering what about kids who are unmotivated to do this work? So a child who, a teenager who would be, you know, isn't really interested in, you know, looking at a book or joining a social skills group or, you know, yeah. things that we know we know could be really useful and beneficial, but taking that step, it's like, why bother? What's the point? You know, kids who are really kind of in that space, how can we encourage them to take a little step? So do it as a family. The, the hack to the resistant kid is instead of, cause what happens is, and you know this from your work, it's like we have the identified patient in the family, right? The one who needs the help. And we mm -hmm. shove all the help in that person's direction. And then it feels embarrassing and it feels like a lot and it feels like you're under a microscope all the time. So I always encourage families to not do that and step back. And instead of saying, oh, here's this great book for you. Hey, I heard about this woman who wrote this book and 
it says teens on it, but I think it's good for all of us. So we're going to start this and mm-hmm. take one thing out of the book and like family meeting or not a family meeting, but just family chit chat. Um, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to try this, you know, every single morning. Um, you know, we're going to try at the end of the day to say our three worst and our three best of the day and just see how it goes. Like, see if it helps us connect a little more. We're so busy. We're so stuck on our screens all day long. We're not having time to talk. Let's do the best and worst every day together while we eat dinner or, you know, before we go to bed at night and see if we can help listen to each other a little bit more. Um, pick one thing and do it as a family and don't put it on that one identified patient in the family because sometimes, and sometimes that's what we really need. You know, we have the one kid who's showing all the symptoms of what's happening in the house, but actually it's a family affair, right? Mm -hmm. We all play off each other, stress trickles down and sideways and upwards and everywhere. It kind of just creeps around. So, you know, there's, there's no sense in not helping everybody manage their stress and worries a little bit better right now. Mm -hmm. I love that. And also, you know, we're modeling, right? That we're modeling mm-hmm. that we need some help. I'll say too, just to add to, to that answer that the phrase that I've used to encourage things that might feel uncomfortable, especially like a social skills group over Zoom or joining something, mm-hmm. which I think could be beneficial is that phrase of, would you be willing to try, right? Yeah. So that's how I try to phrase things. Um, would you be willing to show up one time and to see how it goes? So I try to make it feel really small um, something yeah. that they could potentially step. And I say that to teens all the time. What I say is, um, will you just humor me and just go one time and just see how it is. And then you can tell me because then I'll really know. So we just right. humor me and go one time. Yeah. And that gives a teen a sense of control. Um, yep. And as long as we follow through and respect, if they come back and say, nope, I was right. It sucked. Yeah. Then we have to yeah. respect that too. And then we, yeah, we do. Yep. So, all right, I want to wrap up. Are there any, um, someone just asked what the book is. Again, I'm going to show it one more time. So it's called A Year of Positive Thinking for Teens. Congratulations, by the way. Um, Thank you. You're a busy woman. I can't believe that you wrote this during a pandemic. Um, <laughs> I can't <I'll> either. Have, <laughs> I will leave, um, I'll leave the name of this and Katie's other books in this thread uh, for people who are watching. So you can go um, check out uh, Katie's work that she's done all of it is really resonant for this community and are there any before you say goodbye i'd love to know where people can reach you and also if there's one thing you hope everyone watching this takes away that they can a little tool a little thought that they can bring with them into their parenting life today um okay so you can reach me on uh what is my website that would be good to know practicalkatie.com is my website <laughs> I do know these things, <laughs> and um, I'm on Facebook a lot, Katie Hurley LCSW, and um, same on Instagram and Twitter. So you can find me all those places. I'm the world's slowest emailer. Just Debbie can tell you that. So no comment. So feel free to reach out to me in any of those places, and I'll be happy to hear from you. Um, you know, when you were saying you were going to give away three books. I was thinking, can I double that? Do we have enough? Because I because I have some signed copies I would be happy to send out if you wanted me yeah, to do that. let's do okay. it. You heard it cool. here first, people. All yes. right, we'll do that. So you send me the addresses and I'll get those in the mail. Um, and then, so what's one thing I hope you take away? Well, first of all, this is hard. So congratulations to all of you for going through this in the first place, because I just feel <laughs> like every day is something. And I think you're all doing your best and don't forget that. Um, so, you know, just keep trying, keep swimming. But what I really hope people take away from it is that we all have the power to rewire our brains in little bits and pieces. It's never an overnight overhaul. It always takes time, but we can learn to think positive. You know, we can learn to take a negative situation, deal with it, cope with it, get through it, find some little nugget of information from it that helps us move forward in a new light. And it just takes practice. Yeah. Great thoughts. Great thoughts. And thank you. Congratulations to, to you as well. You're living all this uh, <laughs> along with the rest yeah. of us. And um, Survivors Club. Yes. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> thank you so much. And I just really appreciate everything that you shared today. Uh, I know, again, this is something that is really important to, to the parents in my community who are struggling with their differently wired teens. And you shared a lot of great nuggets. So 
Thank you. I'm gonna let you get on with your busy day. It was lovely. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for watching. This was awesome. And continue to leave questions on here and um, I will share additional resources for you guys as well. All right, take care everybody. Okay.